so that was uh, an old Jim Henson cartoon. I think it's called Drums West. Um, it's where the animators actually created a visual accompaniment to jazz music. Um, and that's going to be relevant a little bit later on, I promise. Uh, but for now, welcome back. Welcome back to another installment of AP Art History Home Edition. Um, as usual, I'm, I'm kind of bummed we're covering some like really big advancements. My cat's scratching me some really big advancements in art history, but I don't have you guys as like an in-class audience. Um, and this is also my favorite time period and the stuff that I, I kind of know the most about. So it's my favorite things to share. So I've decided to bring in an audience. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Sobolewski. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, this is a familiar voice to those of you who traveled with us to Japan. <laughs> He's going to be joining us for, um, well, we'll see, we're gonna see how well this goes. And uh, if it goes pretty well, he might join us for a few other installments um, of our virtual classes. Is there anything you want to share about yourself with the class to get for them to get to know you a little bit? Um, in terms of art, I very much like uh, Kandinsky, and I think some conversations that you and I had just about him and his particular type of abstraction that we'll be talking about today, and how we both really enjoy and appreciate it and it's an art form that I'm like really not uh, well versed in making myself and I think we'll kind of see right. some examples of our work later. Yes, yes we, we did, we created some art to go along with this, to go along with this video today. Um, Alright, so just a refresher, we're gonna um, dive in but just to remind you that we've been like slowly, slowly building towards abstract art at the beginning of the 1900s. Um, so this is when artists began to completely sacrifice details in order to emphasize other aspects of painting. So we covered Manet, um, he got rid of like some background details, and then we looked at Monet and the Impressionists. Um, they really eliminated, de eliminated details to like pursue capturing light. Um, and we looked at Picasso and Brock and how they got rid of pretty much all detail um, just to focus on form. Um, so all of these artists that I just mentioned, they were still representing something. Um, even Picasso and Brock at their most abstract, they were still like Brock was taking a look at a musician um, and he was abstracting from that starting point. Uh, they were showing us their interpretations of like a musician holding a guitar or their interpretation of a still life, but they still had a subject matter as a platform to go off of. What we're going to take a look at today is something a bit different. Um, this is what we call non-objective art. So non-objective art, no object, there's like no subject matter. In my classrooms, this is always the point in the year where many of my students begin booing and hissing because yes. this is the stuff that they feel is... A con. Yeah, this is the stuff everybody's just like, I could do that, a toddler could do that, a seven-year-old could do that. Um, how is How does this cost millions of dollars? How, how is this worth millions of dollars? Um, yeah, and that's, this is, this is, that's kind of why it's my favorite stuff to teach, because um, it's a real challenge sometimes to get you all to like this. It can be a real challenge. I've had classes that really respond to it once we talk about it more, and then I've had some that by the end of the year they're still just like, we get it. But nah. I think Kandinsky is a really great entry point because most students love music. And he's still, it still looks a little like something. It's We're going to see a couple things yeah. in this piece that you can, it's, you, your brain can at least still process a little bit of what you're seeing mm -hmm. more so than, you know, some other artists that will be covered later. I think since, yeah, I think since we're, st I'm, I haven't covered Duchamp yet. Right. We're going to talk about him on Thursday. Um, in like a live session, our first like very live session. Duchamp is my favorite person to talk about and, and probably the most polarizing of all of the artists. Well, that one gets, <laughs> I'm not even sure it's not a con joke. <laughs> but um, uh, I'm hoping Kandinsky kind of lays some groundwork for you a little bit in terms of appreciating uh, what we're going to talk about later on this week. Um, so uh, we only have two Russians on our list uh, today. The first one we're going to talk about, his name is Vasily Kandinsky, and he's one of the first artists to create non-objective art or art without subject matter. So now he's not the only one and probably wasn't even one of the first to begin exploring this. What's really interesting is after Cubism, a bunch of artists kind of came to this uh, result in different geographic regions, kind of on their own. Um, but Kandinsky... Um, most historians generally agree, agree that one of the works we're going to take a look at today is considered to be the first non-objective painting. 
which is pretty exciting. So yeah. finally, artwork. It's like with the back. people who. It's like with uh, Talbot and um, Daguerreau, and there's so many times in history where people are arriving at these really genius things simultaneously. Edison and Edison and Tesla. Tesla. Sort of both coming up with a lot of contemporary electricity. But... In, in this time period, too, actually, yeah, yeah. which is interesting. <clears throat> so, a little bit about, we're going to talk about Kandinsky a little bit before we dive into his work. Um, so, uh, as I said, Kandinsky was a Russian artist, and um, he had the gift of synesthesia. Um, so, <laughs> synesthesia is this kind of crazy thing that some people have where they their senses are confused i think that's the best way to describe it um so can wires are crossed i think in your brain yeah, yeah so your wires are a little bit crossed regarding your senses so kandinsky could see sound apparently in my Supposedly. classes <laughs> in my classes it's a go-to joke and we have a scale of how metal something is and synesthesia is always a 10 out of 10. A 10 out of 10. It's, on it sounds band. like a metal band's name. I, I told them about your metal scale. Yeah. Because we, we've kind of started doing that. Yeah, that's bit. great. <laughs> um, so Kandinsky could see sound. Um, and other people have different wires crossed. There are people who can uh, taste sound, which is kind of crazy. Um, yeah, like all, all of the senses can get a little bit muddied in people who have synesthesia. Um, I think tasting sound is probably the most interesting. I feel like there'd be some weird stuff with smell that I'm super curious about. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be able to taste smells. <laughs> that would be the worst. <laughs> but it's all about your associations too, like would right. you? Right, yeah. Maybe I mean, manure is amazing. We, <laughs> <laughs> But we can kind of taste, smell... All, all yeah, that's already... Hands, you're so right. Those two all... are weirdly linked yeah. to begin with. I just don't want it any more enhanced than it is. <laughs> Although, being able to walk into a room where bacon is frying mm -hmm. and not even having to ingest the calories but still getting the taste, right. somebody could turn that into a yeah. million-dollar so idea. That's, okay, Cut was, the mics. <laughs> I was kind of reading about this a little bit, the people who can taste, smell, because I was super curious. And I read an interview with a guy, and he's like, sometimes foods taste like taste like their taste but not all of the time so he said specifically like when he hears the word coffee he tastes coffee when he hears that he mentioned bacon when he hears the word bacon he can taste bacon but then there are a few others where if like he hears the word um i don't know Puss. bread or, ew no i was going food <laughs> well but the way this goes really south on you yeah, is yeah. right <laughs> Is when those things get a little crossy. <laughs> bread is still delightful. <laughs> well, but he might not taste bread. When oh, he hears oh the word okay, bread. I'm sorry. When he hears yeah, bread, yeah. he might taste like jam or something. Right, which is okay. Kind of odd. Yeah, yeah. But oh, and interesting, he, we're, we're really diverging right now. But back to it. Um, one final thing about this guy. He said that it actually um, makes food less interesting to him because he's constantly having taste all the time when people are talking. So he's like desensitizes it. it. It desensitizes it, and he's like less interested in eating overall. Which it's a, it's was, a, at first I was thinking diet. this person was possibly the luckiest living human, and now no, I guess it's yeah. less so. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. So Kandinsky had the gift of synesthesia. His wires that were crossed were sound and sight, so he could see sound. Um, and his father kind of recognized his early predilection for the arts. He enrolled him in drawing classes, um, but even though. He always kept it as a hobby. Um, he pursued law education and became a professor. So he became a super successful professor, but he actually didn't begin painting until his um, early 30s. So career change. People used to be very impressive. Some of them. Some of them, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so the idea for his career changes came when he attended a few operas. Uh, he was a huge fan of music. And... Um, he was, he was living, um, I think it's present-day Ukraine right now, um, but back then was a part of Russia. And he saw the German composer uh, Wagner, he saw the opera, I think it's called Lohengrin, and he began to see the colors as the music was playing. Um, so through Wagner, Kandinsky began to understand that music was perhaps like the most abstract and transcendent art form. Um, music can evoke images, it can evoke memories, and it can evoke feelings in someone only using sound. 
Um, so I think you've all probably experienced this, like songs that you listen to a whole lot as a kid and then you hear them as a little bit older and it kind of takes you back. Um, music is this really abstract con concept that can transport you to different places. And it's like the way composers in movies, when it's a scene that's supposed to be sad, will use minor keys. Right. And that will cue you to start mm -hmm. feeling sad in ways sometimes that's really manipulative in movies, but sometimes it's manipulative in the best possible way. In this household, the Avengers score is like... I love the Avengers score. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the, the fight song in the Sobolewski household. <laughs> so, um, Kandinsky also heard the music of a Viennese composer, Arnold Schoenberg, um, who explored what's called atonal music. And it's really good that Mr. Sobolewski is here because um, I, I do, I like music. I actually, actually, I love music, but I don't understand the first thing about it. So when I was trying to read about what the heck atonal music was, um, I, I don't know. But Mr. Sobolewski can explain it a little bit better. <laughs> I listened to a few um, bands, and, and if you if you have ever heard the term math rock thrown about in terms of some rock bands, that's sometimes a reference to this, where they're bands that sort of take the traditional um, sort of schemes of music, like you know, scales and things like that. And they sort of go out of their way to break the rules. There's the old axiom about if if you really want to be like a great artist, you have to learn all the rules so that you can break them. And musicians that's say a similar thing. Yeah. That's, oh, yeah. The <laughs> I think, probably, I, I, think is, I mentioned Is he the it first person who really a, said it? Something like that. Yeah. And it applies across almost all creative fields because the most interesting work, pretty much everybody agrees, like the most fun movies are the ones that do things that are unexpected. And uh, there's a ton of music that, so a perfect example is like in contemporary, you know, um, popular culture, uh, you know, well, I guess it's probably not that contemporary anymore, but like in the 90s, there was like rap rock and bands like Korn, and they would specifically tune their instruments improperly. So a, 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 a guitar or an instrument that's out of tune when you hear it played like a piano that's out of tune even if you're not that knowledgeable about music, you'll sort of be able to just tell, like, something doesn't sound right there. Unless you're me. Some okay. people, there is something called tone deafness. Um, We're which, pretty sure that I have it. I've always heard that it's actually more rare than people think, and that probably you're just not, like, tone sensitive. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, you don't have it very much. And if, if you listen to um, a lot of, like, really, like, um, obscure, like, not obscure, but, like, a lot of really high-level jazz is celebrated for finding ways to make like atonality really um beautiful and like i was talking about like a band like corn or one of my personal favorites and how i sort of got uh sort of involved in this conversation with miss sobolewski is um dillinger escape plan is a band that plays really out of rhythm and really atonally and i love that and it's sort of about hearing the music in what should sound ugly and to the average listener probably does but to a certain percentage of people they see or hear these these rules being broken as beauty and it works for sound and it works for visuals the same way probably even in cooking i bet you yeah, there's a whole school of thought about this but i don't know much about that yet oh like, that's interesting i wonder if there is yeah um so just a little bit now i wanted to share with you a little bit of the music of that viennese composer arnold schoenberg um who kind of pioneered atonal music <laughs> So back to it, Kandinsky uh, actually wrote a letter to this composer and they started writing back and forth to each other and Kandinsky shared his thoughts about explorations of color and he told Schoenberg that he felt that painting might be able to achieve a similar level of, abs of abstraction that music can. Um, and then he left his job as a professor, um, he left Russia and he started attending art school in Germany in music. So it was the early 1900s, and uh, he was exposed to all of the avant-garde art of the time. Um, so in Germany, the most popular style was Expressionism, think Edvard Munch, um, but all avant-garde works had been displayed, including Impressionist, Post-Impressionist, Fauvism, and Cubism. Um, Kandinsky actually began his own group in Germany called the Blue Rider after one of his breakthrough paintings. So this group was made up of the avant-garde artists working there at this time. And afterwards, Kandinsky's own work began to get more and more abstract. So we're going to take a look at some of his work now and kind of go through um, some of his stuff. So this one that we're looking at right now is called the Blue Rider. Super impressionist, I think. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was trying to figure out how I went the wrong way on the slideshow. But um, <laughs> yes, I would for sure. I agree. That would be as somebody who teaches this and still sometimes gets confused about some of the very subtle differences in all these movements. If you were to ask me point blank, I would say this is an impressionist painting. Yes. Yeah. So this is the 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 work that kind of inspired him to form the the German group of all of these German avant garde artists. Um, I I think it's pretty highly impressionist. He's got these short brushstrokes. They're kind of all going the same direction. We're seeing a bit of an emphasis on the light, um, but his work starts to change pretty dramatically. Um, we can kind of see the influence of fauvism in this one. Uh, with kind of the weird use and really bold use of color, or maybe a little bit of Gauguin. Yeah, I, phobism is where my head went immediately. Yeah, Very yeah. childlike. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, what, what, what's the... Um, Non-local. Yeah, yes. And then, but there's also, what was the thing... It, oh, phobism was the one that's named like, it's named like because of brutality or beast. Wild beasts. Yeah, yeah wild yeah, beasts. Yeah, literally yeah, yeah. translates to wild beasts. So we can think of like a more wild use of color, and this is super um, out there. I like this more than that cat. And the goldfish. Yes. Yeah. Or no, it's just goldfish. It's the just cat the one's a different painting. Yeah. But um, yeah, I like this more than the goldfish. Uh, we're starting to really get super more abstract here, but you can kind of still see, like, I don't know, what do you see when you look at this one? I still see a hillside. Yes. And houses. Yeah. Uh, I see clouds. Mm -hmm. I see a sunset or some point in the day where the sky is not, it's a little blue, but there's, there's the sense of, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So we're getting there. Um, I think it's still, like, inspired by a landscape, but... Um, you can definitely still see where his starting point was. Yeah, and you're starting to see it come apart. You're starting to see it come apart, yeah, and that's really important. So let's look at the next one. Um, this one I always think looks like Sunny Side Up Eggs. Yep. I'm like, is this eggs? Same thing. Yeah, we, like, oh, we have no. never talked about that. It's but. a cow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, so I always see eggs first, and then I see cow. But you can you can start to piece together and or still. mandarin oranges and milk. Ew. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Actually, is that weird? That's just ambrosia salad. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Um, so now this is this is actually the work that's on our list. Um, so we're going to see some of the stuff that he does after this too. This is called composition number or improvisation number twenty eight. I always get them confused. But he also has pieces called, called composition. composition improvisation. Yeah. yeah. So he actually started at this point naming all of his paintings the way that composers would name their paintings. So we're seeing a lot of his later artworks from this point on being called things like improvisation followed by a number or composition followed by a number. And this is considered to be the first non-objective painting. And I know what you're trying to do. Um, I know you're looking at this and you're like seeking out the images that you see. And all of us can find something in here. You can all look at this and be like, oh, well, it still looks like a landscape. Um, and maybe to you it does a little bit, but we're going to talk about the point of this kind of painting, and the point is not to try to find things. It's not a where's Waldo. Um, there's not really meant to be a reference point for subject matter. So let's take a look at some of his later stuff before we come back to this one. This is what Kandinsky's really known for, yeah, I think. This is the one that you'll to... find in the most uh, art art college dorm rooms, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah, art college dorm rooms, um, patterns that you'll see on socks or ties, yep. and... Um, <laughs> gift shop. <laughs> yeah, this is this, gift shop art history. Every artist <laughs> has their, like, two or three claims to fame where you, you can buy their stuff on ties and, and everything. Um, I also think this is the one that's most utilized as an elementary art assignment. I, written rightfully so. Yeah, I think for perfect. smart reasons, yeah. 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 Um, so he's known for his circles and squares. And then we're going to take a look at some of his other stuff if we keep going. Um, this one, I don't, I don't know, I feel like this one, when I see this one, the word symphony comes to mind. I think this, to me, I don't even know what the chronology is off the top of my head, but mm -hmm. to me this seems like the full realization of even our current piece that we're studying mm -hmm. still seems like he's working out the kinks. Yeah. And here's where we get to the end result. This is the terminus of the logic of making sound into a visual. Yeah. Because that other one, I, I very much agree with your original sort of warning to the kids. It's hard not to look at that one and not see a cacophonous hillside. Right, yeah. Especially after his other work. Yeah, this one lacks any sort of... You're working overtime if you're finding representation in mm -hmm. here. And you're doing work that you're not supposed to, so stop. <laughs> This is the stuff that I like the most of his. It's like completely non-objective. So we're, he's only exploring line, color, and shape and their relationships with one another. Um, and something, I, I am 
unabashedly, I think, a huge fan of abstract art compared to most people and maybe even compared to you. I don't really, I don't even really know where you You definitely like it more than me. Yeah. But I'm not. You're not. I'm not abashed. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But I, his work that looks like this is some of my favorite stuff. I love the structure of it. Um, I love his use of color. I love the juxtaposition with the black circle. It's some of my favorite stuff. Just to quickly uh, sort of hammer home that point, uh, the joke about the college dorm room thing came from my own life. I (laughs) had that Kandinsky (laughs) painting because I thought it was sophisticated. And it, like, probably could have been, but not for me because I didn't even understand it back then. I was just like, art. (laughs) Uh, So let's take a look at some of his. I think there are just a few more. Um, So we're starting to see, again, he's just exploring these base fundamentals of art making line color and shape i like this one more than the last one i think you're wrong uh, that's fine but uh (laughs) i think um the last one with the circles and the lines although i do enjoy it i want to see that that logic pushed to more extremes um, with different shapes yes and this one is starting to feel more like again something to me that i see in here is consciousness pulled apart as if one's own sort of sense of the world visually can be pulled out of uh, your head like a, like the stuffing of a pillow yeah. and just sort of strewn about. And then this is kind of closer to that for me. And I like that a lot. This is great. What about this? Uh, I, that one also. I, I kind of hate this one. <laughs> this, is, this is what makes art. This is why deep down... A lot of people think that what we do and what we care about is yeah, pointless. Yeah, it's, it's all subjective. <laughs> uh, I just think too much is going on. It's I so definitely crazy. don't like it as much Yeah. as um, <clears throat> the one that we saw three slides ago, which is the one that I described as the natural end point. Yeah. I think this is once you get to that end point and you've perfected it, sometimes you overwork it. Yeah. And this one could be described as a little overworked, but I do still really love the color so much that I don't mind. We've been going through his work chronologically, so we're entering kind of his late era phases here. Um, This is the type of work that's going to go on to inspire the abstract expressionists that we'll talk about next week. Um, So your Jackson Pollock's, your Mark Rothko's, and we're going to talk about Helen Frankenthaler and Willem de Kooning. I love Frankenthaler. Yeah. To, To bring this back to music, this piece is very interesting because... I always have found that I'm a real apologist for the late era work of musicians who were considered great, but their late era is frowned upon or looked at as like lesser work of theirs. And I think this painting does a perfect job of doing what that work can do. Like a perfect example is there's a Bad Brains album that I really like that nobody really likes. and Because nobody knows who Bad Brains is. That's not true. <laughs> um, but the point is that album is mediocre in a lot of ways, but there are moments on that album where only the most advanced and experienced form of that band could get there. So it's like, it has these flashes of the best of them because they're so seasoned, but it also has a little bit of the fact that they're at the end of the thing and they're not like, they're they're not fresh and they're not hungry anymore. So I think that can be found visually just like it can be sonically. So um, that was some of his later era work that he completed um, after like World War II. So we're going to, go um, earlier in his time frame to that one that we looked at about halfway through. Um, and this is the work that's on our list. So this is the one that you need to know about. This one is called Improvisation Number 28. It's by Vasily Kandinsky. Um, or if you're Mr. Sobolewski, you say Vasily because we say everything differently. <laughs> I almost <laughs> just say Vasily, but I've at least acknowledged that the V sound is important. <laughs> um, it was painted in 1912 and it is oil on canvas. And this is considered to be um, accepted by most historians as the first non-objective work ever, which is pretty exciting. Um, <clears throat> so it's called Improvisation. Kandinsky was even naming his works the way that composers would which we talked about before. But at this point um, in his career, Kandinsky felt that uh, creating artwork that referenced the outside world at all was extremely materialistic, which is kind of interesting. Um, because, I would agree, but I think that's okay. Right? So I think as an artist, especially the artists who are exploring different things at this time, so he's like... If you're portraying the outside world, you're looking for the external. And Kandinsky wanted to focus more on the internal and make it more of an exploration of um, what he called spirit. And in the post-photography world, that became the great existential question of art. It's like, 
if we can capture the images of all the things around us, now what? Now what are we doing? So it, it does become more about like, you should be trying to create things that only you could make. Yeah. And that's the heart of this. And he, he really felt that artwork should be a pure response to one's inner state of being. So if you want to get into that, like a bunch more, he actually wrote a book about it. It's called Concerning the Spiritual in Art, which sounds super highfalutin. I will um, personally send any of you $10 if you prove that you read this book somehow. <laughs> I almost ordered it. I've never read <laughs> no, no, no. It. Like, you would read it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not giving you ten dollars. Oh, ten bucks. I'll go buy myself a compact disc. <laughs> um, so when he's talking about inner state of be- being and spiritual, he doesn't necessarily mean um, traditional religion. Um, he's more referring here to one's inner state of being, so like their their individual spirit or what makes them them, as Mr. Sobolewski was saying. So to him, art making was a result of individuality and shouldn't necessarily have to do at all with technical skill or what he called like external vision, so the things that you're seeing in the world around you. Which I know from our conversations in class, many of you um, really appreciate technical skill. Um, many of you look at artworks and artists that can represent the outside world so realistically and, and you're very impressed by that. So this is um, the other side of the coin. It's the complete opposite, which might be a little difficult to digest. I can identify with all of your students who have that sense of like, if this isn't showing a high level of refinement and skill, then why should I be impressed by it? And I think only over time did I even like, I think I used to be like 90% about representation and skill and refinement. And even after having learned a lot about art and teaching teaching this course myself, I'm probably still like 65, 35 mm-hmm. in just wanting to see something executed well. But the, the depths of one's own sort of psyche and one's own way of seeing has become a lot more interesting to me yeah. the older I've gotten and the more I've sort of read and the more I've seen. Going to museums helps a lot. It does. I... I... And pretty similar with your trajectory here. I think I went from one side and then I just did a complete flip. Yeah, you've kind of gone. When I, <laughs> you've gone native. Like. <laughs> I try not to get into my personal opinions too much when teaching this class, but sometimes it can be avoided. I, I love abstract art. Um, and I think when I see something that's painted extremely realistically, um, I just get super bored now. Which probably isn't fair. Is Chuck I know Close, it's not though? Fair. Uh, no, because he's this weird artist where it's actually abstract. Well, and now... He's it, not on our like, list, but maybe er, he should. Not be. now, um, but like he first started with the hyperphotorealism, and then yeah. it turned into something much yes. more compelling. Yeah. But so, I still really like the hyperphoto, hyperphotorealism as well. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, I, when I was in high school, I really hated uh, artwork that looked like this, that was like non-objective or abstract. I didn't get the point of it. I didn't understand its context and art history, um, and it wasn't something that I appreciated. And as the older I get, the more and more I actually really love abstract art. So um, again, going back to Kandinsky here, he's creating his internal um, spirit. So spirit plays a part in this work, but so does science. Um, So it was right around 1910 and 1911 that atoms were discovered to actually have subatomic particles. Um, So electrons, protons, and neutrons. And um, they were, science was revealing like new layers of of understanding and showing us the base fundamentals of our matter. Um, And artists are kind of doing the same thing here. They're stripping away every, like any pretext that has to do with the external and going back to the fundamentals of art which is just line, shape, and color. So it's really interesting that these two, um, two things were happening simultaneously, the scientific discoveries and how artwork was revealing its fundamentals at the same time. Human sophistication, much like we were saying, this was also electricity. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's like we're, our brains collectively as a species seem to grow exponentially, and we just suddenly became very aware of a lot. In a very short amount of time. Right, yeah. 
Um, so, but perhaps the best way to understand non-objective painting is by turning to what actually inspired Kandinsky and it's most, the most abstract art form, which is music. So, um, if you remember our video opening, that animator was visualizing music. Um, that was a Jim Henson video and it's kind of linear where they're more like, um, you can speak to this a little bit more, like showing the, the, the. It, it's almost like an EKG. It's literally just yeah. showing the sound like yeah. happening as it's happening. And it's, and it's an animation, so it's moving, too. And, and it can which, be synchronized, mm -hmm. you know. So that's a little different from what Kandinsky was doing um, and what Mr. Seleski and I did, actually. Um, so Kandinsky wasn't listening to music with lyrics, either. So there's, like, no story or objective yeah. picture to create. If it's just pure instrumental music, then art, the art accompaniment, becomes stripped down to the fundamentals of line, shape, and color. So Mr. Sob and I decided to take this on ourselves. Um, so we both picked a song, and then we listened to it a few times, and we, I don't know, we, we took like 20 minutes, and we tried to... I put the song on repeat, because I just wanted it. I did too. I wanted no other input while I was doing it. And we created um, a work based off of... Um, a song that we listen to. So we're going to share what we made with each other and you right now. So this is um, Mr. Sobolewski's work. What song did you listen to? So I picked a song by the heavy metal band Mastodon called Blood and Thunder. And this I... This is the stuff that he listens to. It, it almost... Yeah, for the most part. Yes. <laughs> um, so I've... So much of my favorite music that is extremely heavy, I think, conveys a sense of power. Um, while simultaneously conveying a sense of um, sort of uh, precision because it takes a lot of... It, again, we're going back to this question in art and in music of skill, and a lot of heavy metal music requires extreme precision w to create something that can sound very ugly and violent. Um, and so my piece, you'll see that I wanted there to be a clear representation of how I was hearing individual precise sounds while also there's this larger thrust of sort of aggression and violence. This is not the sort of art that I feel is a strong point, so I was really trying to push myself to get as abstract as I could, and I still felt like I probably got a little too literal, but I, I, I do think it was a really worthwhile exercise. It made me want to do it again immediately. Um, I like what you did in the background here with, like, the... The vo I think you mentioned those are like the vocals, like yeah. that it looks like more abstracted writing. I kind of tried to pick a color to represent each of the different sort of sonic inputs. So like bass, guitar, drums, vocals. And he's really good at like listening to those individual components of music, whereas as we've talked about, I'm not very good at hearing those individual things. I just, I think I just hear like a, a wall of sound or something. Phil Spector. I'm not even sure. Um, so this is mine. Um, I listened to, I actually listened to an instrumental work and it's one that we've listened to in class when you're like taking a test. It's not, it's not the up soundtrack or that time that I tried to make you all cry while taking an exam. <laughs> um, it's called, it's a song called Happiness by Alex Summers. Um, it's completely instrumental and it starts out with this like white noise sound um so i try to do like very like almost like a fade in from the left and then it becomes highly organized with these uh i would call them chord progressions i think so i'm seeing is this the highly organized we're yeah. talking yes agreed yeah. yeah i totally see that yeah yeah absolutely and then um the song kind of repeats it's very repetitive like over and over and over again it's like these same um the same chord progression kind of getting slowly louder and louder and louder and then at a certain point the like that white noise kind of overtakes the songs and you kind of it becomes a little bit more clear that it's actually the sound of the ocean um so i tried to get like kind of structured towards the middle and then towards the right hand side um more like loose and water based with the watercolor so it was like more blooming happening with the colors um and then since you Throughout, at least when I listened to it the first time, I was like, why is there this, like, crackling white noise in the background? And then it kind of comes through, and at the very end, like, I knew exactly what it was. It was the sound of water. So I have these more structured shapes because it's, to me, showing, like, the clarity of understanding the sound that I was listening to that was causing a bunch of confusion. That's really funny because I see my immediate thought when I looked at yours and the three yellow rectangles was that I wonder if it happened similarly in the process to mine where... The last thing I did was the purple mm -hmm. and them all sort of converging into this kind of spiral sort of hurricane on a Doppler radar thing. Yeah. And this was all meant to just represent the vocals and the way the vocals sort of come in and they sort of hum along. And then eventually it, it the song kind of all comes together and just 
really crescendos and reaches its like fever pitch. And I thought it was really interesting in yours. I love this sort of notion of all the order and the sort of like, this is just a very consistent wall of sound uh, to use your expression. And the first thing I looked at at this was like, I just wanted to know, not ever having heard the song, I really wanted to like know what the yellow rectangles were. And I felt like I bet they were a similar, uh, a similar thought to my sort of purple triangles, but not really based on what you said. It's more that you said it was like the final clarity of realizing it yes. was ocean sounds. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's more of a reveal. And then what made you pick your colors? My colors are really based on the fact that, like, as much as I, in many ways, think of uh, myself as mostly a fairly happy person, um, the... Are you serious right now? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, heavy metal music, a lot of it that I listen to, at least, some of it is, like, I am good married humor. to the angriest person I know. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I think these colors are really just there to show... That this song is not really, um, it, it, it doesn't have a lot of brightness. Um, it, it's the, the colors are there to convey a sort of like, purple is the end result of blue and red. Mm -hmm. And I knew I just wanted to get to purple. Yeah. The song is very purple to me. It's purple and black probably in my head. Mm -hmm. The closest I can get to having this synesthesia about this song is that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deconstruct purple and show how all the elements come together for the strongest, sort of sharpest phrases. Sonic yeah. phrases. My song, I chose like blues because it just felt, it feels like a very icy water song to me. And I was just like, I'm going to go blue. I have to say though, your palette, you said the song, is the song happy or is the song just called happy? The song is just called happy. So it's not, it is not right. Like happy and that like is very well it, conveyed yeah. then, right? Yeah, yes. it is not, it doesn't sound right. happy. Yeah, it's like a Beach Boy song. Well, Beach Boy songs it's sound the inverse. happy, but it's, they're they not sound happy. happy, but they're not. Yes. Yeah. Hey, I know something about music. You did. Um, she so, really downplays how much she actually. She has very good taste in music. She just doesn't pay I attention don't to it. Understand it. it. Um, so there you have it. Um, we did this little exercise. So if you want to do the same thing, pick a song and then try to create a non-objective painting. Um, to go along with the song that you picked and then um, email it to me or post it on classroom I'd love 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 to see your results um, we both had fun doing it and we set some parameters we only we were just like 20 minutes yeah. listen to the song on repeat create um, and see what happens and so no representation no, no represent yeah uh, it's yeah. non-objective so yeah. no representation um, but uh, that was all inspired by our artist for today that was Vasily Kandinsky and the advent of non-objective art and as always if you have any questions don't hesitate to reach out through Google Classroom or email I'm here to help thank you